now because we've hit six o'clock. So welcome everybody. My name is Luke Whitington. I'm the Executive Officer of the Search Foundation. Um, uh, before we begin, and I'm your host for this evening's event, before we begin, please be aware that this briefing is being, uh, or event is being recorded so we can post it later to the Search Foundation YouTube channel. And I'll post a link to that in the chat, se chat section. Indeed, I'll post links to lots of things in the chat section during tonight's event, including where you can buy the book, Radicals, Remembering the 60s. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging, as we do with all our events, that we are meeting here in Australia on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land. Sovereignty of this land was never ceded. This land was taken without consent, without treaty and without compensation. And I encourage everyone to get their submissions into the voice co-design process by tomorrow. I pay my respects to elders and leaders past, present and emerging of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, traditional owners and First Nations all across the continent. I'm on Gundungurra and Darug land here in the Blue Mountains, where we say, Warami Gamarada, welcome comrades. We're very lucky to have Meredith Bergman and Nadia Wheatley with us here tonight. But before we uh, get into that and I introduce them, I'll just do a very quick 30 second introduction to the Search Foundation and then an introduction to Meredith and Nadia. After that, Meredith and Nadia will speak uh, together for around 25 minutes, perhaps more, however they're feeling, however it's going. Uh, Nadia has prepared a, a very cool slideshow for us, which we'll watch um, with images from the book. And then we will have questions and uh, then we'll wrap up on the hour. We're trying to keep it strict to the hour so everyone can go and have dinner. Uh, during the talk, you can submit questions to me in the chat section directly, uh, and then I'll ask you if you want to ask that, or let me know if you want to ask that question yourself, um, or you want me to ask it on your behalf. Uh, at the moment, the chat section is limited to messages just to me. At the end of the meeting, we'll open it up so you can message everybody, including our two guests, so that you can uh, say hello to old friends and comrades as well. So quickly to introduce SEARCH, SEARCH is a membership-based democratic socialist organisation that links and enables socialist activists across political parties, across generations and across movements all around Australia. We have members from diverse backgrounds, uh, movements and interests, but we have common aims and values, summarised in our goal of democratic ecological socialism. We run socialist education programs, we publish news and views on Facebook and at search.org.au. And we put on events like this one. This is our first one for the year. So thank you very much for coming to it. I encourage you to like the Search Facebook page to keep up with our events and go to search.org.au to read uh, what we're up to. And if you're interested in applying for membership, that's the place to go to as well, search.org.au. So our contact details are on the website and on our Facebook page. Now to introduce our two very special guests for this evening, the authors, Meredith Bergman and Nadia Wheatley of Radicals Remembering the 60s. Meredith Bergman is a former academic who also served as the Labor President of the New South Wales Upper House. She is the co-author with Verity Bergman of Green Band's Red Union, The Saving of the City, which was reissued 20 years after its original publication in 1998. Meredith has also authored books on ASIO and misogyny, very relevant to the current political debate. She's the founder of the founder of the Ernie Awards for Sexism, which are hilarious and fun to go to. And on retirement from Parliament, she was elected president of the Australia Council for International Development. As we we're talking about just before, Meredith is also a Sydney Swans ambassador. Nadia Wheatley is an Australian writer whose published works include picture books, novels, biography, memoir, and history. A Five Times Dizzy in 1982 was hailed as Australia's first multicultural book for children. Other social and political issues explored in her work include conservation, unemployment, refugees, and learning from country. Among her numerous awards is the New South Wales Premier's History Award for the life and myths of Charmian Clift. And uh, Nadia's most recent book, other than this one, of course, is her, the memoir, Her Mother's Daughter, 2018. So welcome, Nadia Wheatley and Meredith Bergman. Thank you so much for being there. Um, tell us about Radicals Remembering the 60s. Thank you very much, Luke. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we that I'm here today on Gadigal land and pay tribute to their elders. And you out there, fellow Zoomsters, are on um, other First Nations lands, which of course were never ceded. Um, now, to begin, one of the one of the best known slogans of the '60s is the claim that the personal is political. 
we said it to each other all the time. Although, although no one is sure who first said this, nevertheless, it expresses the spirit of the time. And of course, in any era, people bring their personal history to their political life. But in this book, we relate the personal stories of 20 people from our generation who rejected the polit political views and values of their family, school, church, and often class. These radical about terms were often accompanied by epiphanies, awakenings, revelations, call them what you will, we call, often call them aha moments. Now, I want to start by telling you about one of our, of our participants in the book. We, we, we talked to 20 uh, radicals from the period and, and talked to them about their, their epiphanies and awakenings. And I'll just talk to you about one of them to start with. I want to talk about Margaret Roadnight. Now, many of you will remember her, the amazingly tall folk singer with the wonderful voice and the giant afro. afro. And she used to sing from the back of the moratorium trucks, uh, often wearing a little mini skirt and this powerful, powerful voice. Now, one would imagine that folk singers of the period were all left-wingers to start with. It sort of folk sort of almost meant left-wing. But Margaret, who came from a very Catholic background in suburban Melbourne, Riley describes herself at one stage as being the only right-wing folk singer in Australia. So what changed her? What part of the zeitgeist of the 60s had the effect on her? She does mention the importance of her great friend and mentor, Jeannie Lewis, who the, the folk singer from Sydney, who was, of course, the daughter of, of communists. So she mentions Jenny Lewis, but to her, there was one particular song that really resonated. And that song was written by an American um, song, singer songwriter called Malvina Reynolds. And it was the plaintive lament that we all know, which is, what have they done to the rain? And Margaret tells in chilling detail how she suddenly realized that this was about nuclear fallout. It was the, it was the beginning of the, the real fear of atomic warfare. And she suddenly realized that this song that she was singing as a folk song was about nuclear fallout. And to her, this was her aha moment or her, or her turning point. Uh, and Margaret later on uh, goes to America at, on a, on a singing tour and actually meets Malvina Reynolds. And Malvina Reynolds is, is taking her through the, you know, the expressways of Los Angeles and points up to a hillside and says, see those houses up there? They're the little boxes. Because Malvina Reynolds was probably more famous for having written the Pete Seeger uh, hit, Little Boxes, Little Boxes on the Hillside. So to, to Margaret, it was the, the, the quite simple folk songs of Malvina Reynolds that were her aha moment of the 60s. Nadia. Okay, so I also will acknowledge where I am. I'm a bit, I'm a bit to the west of Meredith, so I'm on Wongle as well as, well as Gadigal land, Wongle land from Benelong's people as well as Gadigal land. And in Radicals, we have three people from First Nations. We have Gary Williams and Gary Foley from the Gumbanja Nation of the North Coast. And we have Bronwyn Penrith, whose family are traditional owners of the area around Walliga Lake. So Bronwyn herself grew up at Brungle in the Snowy Mountains and has made Redfern very much her home. Of course, growing up with systemic racism, young Aboriginal people didn't tend to have the same revelation or aha moment as us non-Indigenous comrades. Nevertheless, Gary Foley told me a story which may be unfamiliar to you. I know some of you will know Gary, but this is a somewhat of an earlier story, which is very much one of his radical awakenings. He had came from a very loving and happy family and he had a very positive time in Tenterfield in primary school. But by the time he was at high school, he'd moved to Nambucca and he was going to Maxville High. 
Now, he was one of the very few Aboriginal children students there um, because most of the Aboriginal students, like his cousin Gary Williams, went to Catholic schools. So he was an Aboriginal kid at Nambucca Maxwell High, doing very well, great at sport, great at football, great at running. Um, he describes himself, strangely enough, as the class clown, and but also doing typically academically. He was in the winter and he finished here, still doing well, anticipating going on to the final year. He actually had a club sponsoring him but he was called into the principal's office at the end of fifth year and the principal said to him, don't come back next year, Foley. Naturally, Gary said, why not? And the principal said, and when Gary said this to me, we were in a cafe, and Gary hit the cafe table as he said every word. The principal said, we don't want your kind here. And Gary said to me, and now I'm quoting his words, as Gary described it, he said, when the headmaster did that, he did severe damage to my self-esteem, my self-confidence, and worst of all, he destroyed my belief in education. And so Gary left school and it took him 30 years before he went on or went back into education and went to tertiary education. And he sees that as something he regrets. And I see it as something I regret because Gary is a great historian. He's gone on to become a great archivist, a great professor of Australian history. But all of us have missed out on 30 years of history writing that Gary Foley could have written because of the racism of a principal. And sadly, you would find that kind of systemic racism and branding of Aboriginal students continuing on to this day. Okay, Meredith. Yes, apart from any personal issues we might have brought to our activism, for both of us, as for all the comrades in this book, the catalyst for our radicalisation was the shared experience of growing up in the political circumstances of Australia in the 1950s. Certainly the ferment of the 60s was an international phenomenon, and for young radicals from Berlin to Berkeley, it represented some sort of reaction to a Cold War childhood. But in this country, there was something in particular to, that drove us absolutely wild. Elected in 1949 to head the first coalition government of the Liberal and Country Parties, Prime Minister Robert Gordon Menzies cast a long shadow over the childhood and adolescence of our post-war generation. For a 20-year-old Australian today, who has lived through seven Prime Ministers, it would be impossible to imagine how stultifying it was to grow up under a single one and a patriarchal conservative one at that. It's easy to point to the Menzies government's support for policies such as white Australia and assimilation, not to mention the military commitment in Vietnam, but just as bad was the cultural repression. Growing up behind the white picket fence of Menzies Australia was deadly boring. Often unable even to say what was wrong, we knew we had to make our escape using whatever resources we had. But I had to escape from Beecroft, for instance. Okay, well, so to return to Meredith and myself, and particularly to return to the exhilarating and archetypal 60s year of 1968. To outsiders witnessing our increasingly frequent arrests, Meredith and I probably seemed like surprising radicals. Both of us were from middle class and politically conservative families. Both of us had been educated at single sex private girls schools and both of us were raised in the dreary puritanism of Sydney Anglicanism. By 1968 we were both doing English honours and we were both living at Women's College where we both failed to fit in to the ethos of the college system, which was pretty much um, centered on finding a boy to invite you to the Paul's formal. <laughs> However, despite these similarities, there was a great difference in our respective backstories, which shaped in a way our radicalization. So Meredith will tell you her backstory. Well, uh, this is really my sort of aha uh, moment. Um, it was purely and simply the war in Vietnam. 
and when when I was president um, and the uh, deleg Vietnamese delegation used to come to Australia, I always used to say, if it wasn't for your country, I would not be here. I would be off either teaching English in some country town or, you know, writing the great Australian novel. But um, certainly Vietnam changed my life. I came from a loving, but on the surface, very Menzies voting family in Beecroft. But it wasn't until I was an adult that my father told me that he had secretly voted Labour all his life because it was my mother that had all the political views and she thought Sir Robert Menzies was a great man, which was a fairly common view in Beecroft at that time. It was an absolutely homogeneous suburb. I didn't even meet a Catholic till I got to university. It was white Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, and, and they weren't even from private enterprise. They were public service families. My world was Ming's world, but I went to university in 1966 and strangely I met a bunch of young Catholic radicals in what was called the Newman Society and they were all very anti-Vietnam, they were older than me and they knew about stuff. And I started to worry about this war where my government was sending young men off to kill people in my name and I didn't believe that this war was a just war. Um, and I, I was still very Anglican, even though I'd sort of stopped believing, I still had this real worry about the, the whole uh, criminality of, of the Vietnam War. Um, and the more I learned about Vietnam, the more I started to worry about other things that our government was doing, um, the white Australia policy, um, their support for the apartheid regime in South Africa, uh, their uh, suppression of, of any Aboriginal rights at all. I mean, children were still being stolen in 1967. When, when I went to university, children were being, still being taken away for no reason other than the, that they were Aboriginal. So my aha moment was brought about by my understanding of the war in Vietnam, the, the horror of it, to some degree, conscription was part of that. But to me, it was always more about the actual war itself rather than the conscription obviously emphasized the unjustness of it. But to me, it was the war. Um, but my actual aha moment was very sudden. I remember waking up one morning and catching the train into, into university and it was really on the way in on in the train that I realised I'm a socialist, and I, I got to university, and I remember walking down that very rather smelly corridor in the McCallum Building, uh, where the SRC was, and I saw Jeff Jeffrey Robertson coming towards me from the other from one of the rooms, and I raced up to him and said, Jeff, Jeff. I think I'm a socialist. And he said, oh, don't be silly, Meredith, we're all socialists. So um, that was my actual aha moment when I, and from then on, everything became quite simple and ordered in, in, in my universe. So Nadia. Okay, well, unlike Meredith, I fitted the media stereotype of the confused and angry young rebel who was venting a personal anger as well as anger about political causes. Because of the death of my mother when I was nine and she'd suffered a long illness before that, so family separation had been going on since I was six, my family life and childhood and adolescence was dysfunctional and miserable. In Radicals, I describe myself as having been what I call a good girl throughout my ch childhood from that time and adolescence. This wasn't because of any innate qualities of virtue, but simply because by then I'd become a foster child in a family and I was too scared to say boo. I was obedient, I wiped up all the time. Um, I was scared, I was frightened for 10 years. So silenced and disempowered, by 1968, I had a decade of stored up anger and grief inside me ready to burst out. But in another way, apart from this 
difference of family backgrounds, Meredith and I came to radicalism from different ends of the spectrum. She's described wonderfully her alertness to the issues of Vietnam and to other issues such as apartheid, assimilation and so on. Um, for me, it was completely the opposite. Since the unhappiness of my childhood, I had retreated entirely into my brain and into books so that my intellectual world ran between the ancient English poem Beowulf and T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland written in 1921, post-World War I. I never read the newspaper. I never watched television. At Women's College, there was actually only one set and you had to go over to the wing where the third years lived. So it wasn't really very encouraging to watch television, but I knew nothing about world events. And insofar as I knew anything about Vietnam, I thought it was an island somewhere up to the north of Australia. Okay. Nevertheless, this day came, which I can date from uh, newspaper records as being Wednesday, the 19th of June, 1968. I was sitting at Women's College lunch, nibbling on a lettuce leaf in, on my perpetual diet. And Meredith came in and said she was going on a demonstration downtown that afternoon. There'd been a front lawn meeting. Uh, Meredith, though she'd been involved in these issues, hadn't gone on a demo before. She said, would anyone like to come? And I heard my voice piping up, I'll come. Um, so on the way down on the bus, Meredith tried to fill me in very quickly about the history of the war in Indochina. And we went to what was going to be standing outside the office of the Minister for Labor and National Service in Martin Place, as three or four people took a petition up to his office. It was quickly decided we'd all go up with the petition. 92 of us went up and still within office hours, um, found ourselves having what was one of the first sit-in. So it hadn't been billed as a sit-in. I didn't know what a sit-in was. I'd never heard of that. I was surprised people started singing this song that seemed to be about we shall not be moved, which I'd never heard before. And But when the policeman arrived to, re, to tell us to go, he read this thing called the Crimes Act and said we would be liable to two years jail if we didn't get up and go. And for me, that was a complete crossing the Rubicon moment. In my foster family, I'd had a lot of ridiculous rules. And this seemed to me a ridiculous rule that in office hours, in a public office for sitting on a carpet, I could go to jail for two years. So thinking I could well be arrested, I stayed in the building. Of course, I was just dragged out, um, tossed onto the pavement of Barton Place. Um, but that was really a moment of decision making and from that there was no going back. So Meredith has cited the slogan, the personal is political. And for me, that was absolutely true. The personal liberation I found through being involved in the anti-Vietnam movement was incredible. I felt I had a family. I felt I had a community. I had a voice. Being out on the streets yelling was just fantastic for me. Linking arms with comrades was a sense of physical contact that wasn't sexual. It was just physical. And having missed out on fun through childhood and adolescence, I had fun. So that was my personal 60s. But in this book, and we maybe need to make this clear, um, we have our own definition of when the 60s are. So it's not just the decade from 60 to 70, our decade, our 60s is more of a mood and a movement than a specific slice of time. We started in 1964, which was when um, the introduction of conscription ramped up what was already a small anti-Vietnam movement. 1965, as you would remember, saw the Freedom Ride for Aboriginal Rights, and then by 1967, the referendum delivered a whopping support for what was seen as bringing social justice for Aboriginal people, which of course has not been delivered. 1968, the archetypal year when the explosion of what seemed like revolution in Paris and Prague encouraged us all, even though we didn't have any cobblestones to throw at the constabulary. Then the first moratorium, 1970, 
the decade, our decade, reaches midpoint. 71, the anti-apartheid movement. 72, the land rights movement really taking off after the Aboriginal embassy is established um, on Australia Day, Invasion Day, under a beach umbrella. And of course, by the end of 72, the majority of Australians voted that it was time for a change. True to his promise, Whitlam brought the troops home, introduced something new called multiculturalism, and all of this was a victory for radicalism. Our 60s concludes with the dismissal of the Labor government and the return of a Liberal country party coalition. Now we'll each tell another story about the radicalization of one of the comrades from this book. So Meredith will tell you another. Yes, yes, well, I, I'll, I'll talk now about John Derham. Now, many of you will remember John Derham as the actor who played V.A. Santa Maria in that wonderful series, um, True Believers. Um, but, uh, and the interesting thing about John is that his uh, radicalization does not occur so much through the political process, but through the cultural process of, of theatre and art. He found himself as a 17 year old, as an actor, uh, as a jobbing actor in, um, in Melbourne. He, he, he didn't go to university, um, but by chance he has the good fortune to end up at the Emerald Hill Theatre. Now, many of you will remember that name. It was a very, very important uh, way of bringing um, radical ideas into Australia. The, the, the two men there in charge were George Whaley and Roll Cherry, both of whom were quite important in John's... Uh, he saw them as mentors to some degree. Um, and Emerald Hill was bringing um, the British, mainly the British playwrights, which is very interesting because most of us had our radicalisation experience through what was happening in America. We were following... The, the, the civil rights movement in, in, in the South, we were following things like the trial of the Chicago Seven and the anti-war happenings in, in America. So, but Don's um, cultural uh, revelations come about through the British playwrights. And, and I'm, people like John Arden, um, John Osborne, and plays like Private Jacob Jex, Sergeant Musgrave's Dance, and of course, Spike Milligan. We forget what a wonderful anti-war uh, dramatist Spike Milligan was. Um, so it's very much a cultural influence rather than a political one. So John starts to starts thinking about these these plays that he's in and, and watching them and talking to the other uh, actors about these plays and then reading further material by those playwrights. But the thing that actually I think he saw as his real aha moment was in uh, 1967, he finds himself outside Pentridge Prison at eight o'clock in the morning on th the 3rd of February, 1967, when Australia hanged Ronald Ryan, the last man executed in Australia. And John describes and he sort of had thought he wouldn't go to this demo, but it, he lived near nearby and he walks down to be there. And at eight o'clock, when the execution happens, he describes the flock of pigeons flying up from inside the jail. And that was obviously as the clank of the, the gallows happened. And he finishes this part of his story reminiscing about that moment and about they actually hung someone and he finishes by saying they're not just they're just not listening they're just not listening and I think so much of what we were demonstrating about in the 60s was this feeling that they're just not listening. Okay well my second story will be about Brian Laver. So our book does go out of Sydney and Brian Laver was far north Queensland. He comes from the famous Laver tennis family so he's the cousin of Rod Laver who in the 60s was the world's number one professional. A University Blue in 
as well as being the student main student leader or one of the main student leaders at the University of Queensland. He comes from an extended family of what he calls cattle men in the Fitzroy River region of North Queensland. But when he was a few years old, he moved to Rockhampton. Born in 1944, in Rockhampton, he grew up very aware of the presence of the American troops that had been there during the war. And he grew up with the sense that the enemy, the fascists, as he saw them, might have invaded North Queensland. Um, this led to a very, very early awareness of fascism. His moment of radical revelation was particularly acute and has lasted for the rest of his life. And it happened when he was 12 years old. He was in first year at a private boys school in Rockhampton and a teacher, actually a conservative teacher, showed the boys film footage of concentration camps in Nazi Germany and of, con and of prison camps in Stalin's Russia and it was Stalin's Soviet Union. For Brian, this was a complete revolution, rev revelation that the left would do this as well as the right. He saw himself being anti-totalitarian from that point. A few months later, the school had an oratory competition and he won it with the topic of anti-totalitarianism, which is pretty odd for a 12 year old. While the other boys were talking about hobbies and sports, that was Brian's passion. The two things, that belief and also the oratory, took him on into university. And he was one of the very well-known speakers at the University of Queensland, often, as left-wing speakers, were under a barrage of missiles thrown by the right-wing students. OK, Meredith, up to you. As, as these stories show our generation, but for our generation, radicalism meant openness and freedom. It meant the particular kind of grassroots organisation and new left ideology that arose in opposition to the, the hierarchical structures and dogmatism of the old left. And it meant fun, not fundamentalism. So our book, Radicals, does not set out to give a comprehensive history of the era. Rather, it's a bunch of people talking to the two of us and through us to each other, and hopefully to you, the reader. This conversation is a collective reminiscence composed of individual awakenings that turn 20 people into radicals. Our characters span the political spectrum. We've got anarchism, Trotskyism, Maoism, pragmatism, pragmatism as well as Labor Party members, although some people might think they're the same, DLP supporters, the non-aligned and those who just wanted to keep their noses clean. Obviously comrades who came from left-wing family backgrounds didn't fit the bill. We wanted to talk to people whose parents had supported the policies of Menzies or of the DLP. So they'd had this awakening. We also wanted a balance between people who made a predominantly political response to the times and those who expressed their radicalism through art and culture. And we've also interviewed LSD Fogg, the, you know, the lighting guy, the lighting and mist guy. Uh, Vivian Binns, the, the feminist artist, we have tried to get not just political people. Uh, so, and so we talked to people who had escaped via archetypal 60s routes such as drugs, transcendental meditation and happenings. And that, that describes totally one of our characters, Robbie Swan. Once we'd chosen the people, we interviewed them together, but we wrote up their stories individually. This book isn't just a collection of interview transcripts. In keeping with the notion that the personal is political, our own stories interweave with the stories of the book's participants. Right. Before we began the interviews, we thought that Vietnam would be the radicalising influence for all the participants as it had been for us. But we were surprised to find that there were certain local specific issues. For instance, in South Australia, the gerrymander loomed large for Peter Duncan. On many campuses, student rights were as important as Vietnam. And in Brisbane, the students had to win the right to march on the streets before they could get out about Vietnam. Obviously, the twin issues of conscription and Vietnam created an atmosphere of chaos and demonstrations. But that wasn't it alone. Opposition to capital punishment, racism and apartheid, 
support for land rights, drug law reform, women's rights, gay rights, censorship or anti-censorship. There were so many issues that drew our participants onto the streets. And although the Australian left was influenced by international ideologies, it was on the whole devoid of the violent aspects of the American and European movements. No weather underground, no angry brigade, no barter mine half Meinhof gang for us down under. And I had to think about this, but perhaps it can partly be explained by the fact that there's almost no, cu no culture of political violence in modern Australia as distinct from the very violent massacres of colonial Australia. Also, we, and I think this is really important, we had a class-based party that was committed to bringing the troops home. American youth had no democratic path, path to peace. Both of the major parties were intent on pursuing the war. And in fact, so many of our demonstrations were against the Democrat, Lyndon Baines Johnson. So we really have to remember that difference between us in Australia and the Americans. In conclusion, what was the effect of being part of Radical 60s? How has it affected people afterwards? Well, all of the people in this book believe that the 60s changed them forever. Some were scarred by their experiences in the struggle, but all have continued to work for a better world, either at the macro or micro level. So just a few examples. Geoffrey Robertson in London, fighting for human rights. Bronwyn Penrith in Redfern, chair of Mudjingale Women's Centre. Gary Williams in Nambucca, helping reclaim the gum banger language for the next generation. Robbie Swan, fighting censorship. Josepha Zobsky and Margaret Reynolds, a lifelong commitment to women's equality. David Marr, maintaining his rage against the privilege and power of Australian Tories. Helen Boise, conserving the heritage shacks at Era Beach. Vivian Binns and Margaret Roadnight, who continue to inspire audiences through their chosen art practice. And Brian Labor, who is the world's only anarchist international tennis coach. For all of us, is about idealism, aspiration and determination. The settled verities of the 50s were being challenged in the streets and the lecture theatres, determined to change the world and we did. Okay Luke, so now we'll have our adventurous um, picture and musical interlude if we can bring off the technology. So I'll hit share screen and so we'll see where we go. And I'll hit play and see how we go on that. Or should I just mm. wait one second? Start it off. Okay. Right. Brilliant, thank you. I'll pause Country Joe, we'll come back to him. First, I want to say thank you so much for that brilliant presentation. I kind of um, have to admit, I didn't know you were doing a, such a great double act. You said you're very polished, so brilliant, thank you. And uh, also, I want to welcome everybody 
uh, who has joined us uh, since we first kicked off. As I said at the start, my name is Luke Whitington. I'm the Executive Officer of the Search Foundation. So now we can get into questions. Um, so please, you can, uh, if you'd like to, you can you know, raise your hand or simply just put it in the chat and uh, it'll come straight to me and I can um, uh, ask the question on your behalf if you like, or I can uh, uh, have a call on you, unmute you and, and, um, and put you on the screen so you can ask the question uh, directly. So um, I might kick off if that's, if it's, uh, take the, um, the initiative as it were. Um, you, as the last slide showed there, uh, and as you've sort of touched on, most of the people uh, in the book are still radicals. Um, all of them. All of them. Uh, and still fighting for either specifics or, or, or you know, on certain campaigns, the ones that you mentioned, my mind is thinking, oh, look, there's a whole bunch of potential search members I'm going to hit up to, uh, <laughs> to link and enable people across different movements. Um, would you say, you know, during the, the writing of the book, during the interviews, uh, what was a surprise in, uh, what was a revelation for you about, you know, uh, as you mentioned, you said that Vietnam was expected to be a um, main motivator, you know, because for so many people it was. And I know uh, there's a fair few people who are in this meeting who uh, were radicalised over that as well. What was a more, what was the most surprising reason for, for a, uh, an aha moment or a, you know, conversion from a, a sleepy family background to a, a radical uh, approach to things. Meredith, you've got to talk about Jeff Robertson. Well, yes, I'll talk about Jeff Robertson, but I just want to say first about um, Gary Williams because he, his aha mark, he had a reverse one in that when I said to him, oh. and what about Vietnam? And he just, and Gary Williams, of course, is a, a um, Gumbungia uh, man from the north coast of New South Wales. And he just said, no, I thought about that as a white fella's war. So isn't that interesting? He was there uh, being in, very involved with the anti-apartheid movement, very involved in the early um, uh, Aboriginal rights movement, but didn't see Vietnam as something to be involved with because it, he saw it as a white man's war. And of course, in Australia, it was a white man's war, as opposed to America, where it was very much the African-Americans who were fighting the war. So I thought that was really interesting. But for, um, speaking about Jeff, what absolutely got up his nose was uh, when he was a, in his final year at school, he realised that the private school boys on the train, because he was a public school boy from Epping High, and he realised that the private school boys had a thicker edition of The Tempest, which was the um, Shakespeare play that they were doing that year. And what had happened was that the Shakespeare, the good bard, had been extremely... Um, uh, bowdlerized and all the sexual parts of the Caliban relationship and everything had been taken out of, of the book that the uh, public school boys got. And I, the interesting thing is that for Jeff, I'm not even sure it was about censorship. I think that was about privilege, that he suddenly realised that the private school boys got to read the unexpurgated edition, whereas the public school boys had to have the uh, bowdlerized bard. And um, it just it surprised me that that seemed to be the thing that made him determined to fight at a, at a law level. He, he's, he's very clear that he said that he was going to fight for justice, um, but he, he always wanted to, as he said, keep his nose clean because he was going to do it at the legal level. I'd just like to have a quick word about Vivian Binns, the artist, because her aha moment um, wasn't what people might see as directly political. Um, she had was always saw herself as searching for truth and beauty, but mainly truth. She realized she wasn't gonna find that at the National Arts School. Like many of our people, she had a mentor, a friend and mentor, and in her case, soulmate and lover as well, who was the avant-garde artist, Mike Brown. And he introduced her to automatic, automatic drawing, or, 
which was something that the Saralists had done, where Viv describes it as like doodling, but with more intensity. So she was doodling these images. And then like Meredith, she had a waking up in the morning thing. She woke up one morning and she thought, when lovers love each other, they love each other's genitals. So why do painters spend so much time painting each other's faces? So she decided to do a picture of genitals. And in fact, it was a metre high psychedelic colour. That's one of the things we had up on screen, picture of a vagina, but it wasn't bright. It wasn't bright. She kept going back to it, going back to it. And then this idea came into her brain and she put all these teeth around it. So she had all these teeth around the vagina. And it was when a psychologist, actually a member of the push, saw it, he pointed out to her what she didn't know, that a well-known sort of psychological phenomenon is called vagina dentata, which is meant to be women's aim to emasculate men um, with teeth around their vagina. And she says, how would a suburban girl like her have come up with that image? So she painted in the teeth the, the painting went up at Waters Gallery in an exhibition in 1967 and it absolutely shocked the art world that a woman would come up not just with such a frank picture of genitals but such a scary picture of genitals. Well that's very uh, relevant for the next question I've got um, from Paul Norton and I've actually got one also from uh, your contemporary at Sydney University, Jennifer Whitington, who's my mother, who's on the in the meeting tonight. Um, so Paul Norton, very good comrade of ours from Queensland, says, after a very warm day of campaigning in February 1996, I spent a late afternoon drinking with some male veterans of the 1960s left in Brisbane. The main topic of conversation was about the deeply flawed behaviour of 1960s male student radicals towards women and the need to take account of women's liberation critiques of the male radical left. I would like the presenters to offer their perspectives on this issue. And yes, my mum said, um, what about their feminist awakening? It was her, uh, her question. So sim similar sort of thing. Uh, Paul asked, I'd like your pre the presenters to offer their perspectives on this issue. Look, I found the male left so infinitely better than college boys. Um, <laughs> so did I. <laughs> that, you know, for the first time, I was able to have male people as comrades. Um, yes, in the book, there's a couple of specific um, feminist awakening stories, um, notably that of Josefa Zobsky. And so we didn't um, put a lot in about our own feminist uh, awakenings. Um, probably a lot of you have seen the film Brazen Hussies, which is on at the moment, and there's going to be a showing here in Sydney of it soon. Um, and that shows the famous day when Kate Jennings got up at Sydney University and berated the left um, there and said that we had to um, be concerned with feminist issues, which was certainly true. But I have to say that at the time, I actually felt that while men, young men were being conscripted and being sent to Vietnam, that that was actually for me a more urgent priority in that year of 69, 70, um, and that I felt my own feminist issues could wait on hold for a couple of years. So it was a bit later that I um, got involved with women's liberation. Yes, and um, so thinking about the male radical left, I just have to agree with Nadia that they were so wonderful compared to college boys that um, I, I tried not to be too critical of them. Uh, in, at Sydney University, there was a charismatic student leader called Mike Jones, who was very convinced of his own charisma, which I never quite felt, I must say. But it, it, they were irritating rather than nasty. They really were, I, I can't remember a moment where a, a man on the radical left in that late 60s behaved truly terribly, but they were very, very sure that they were the people that did the speaking while the women were the people that ran the rodeoing machines. I still remember that. And also when those were the days when having keyboard skills were definitely a woman's job. And so we all knew how to type and they didn't. So they'd write these excellent pieces and we'd have to type them out for them because they couldn't. Um, I was considered a bit weird because I was one of the few women that ever spoke on the front lawn. Um, and I thought that was weird 
but I realise now that it was just very, very intimidating for other women to do that. And yes, it was a very sexist period, but as Nadia says, we were so overwhelmed about the need to stop the war in Vietnam that it was almost like this other fight had to take second place for a while. And Bronwyn Penrith in our book um, echoes that kind of statement in regard to the Aboriginal movement. And she says that in that era, the movement, the Aboriginal land rights movement had to come first, uh, apart, separate from Aboriginal women's justice issues. But she says, these days we would have more expectations of our men, but at that time, the priority was the movement. And I think the same was true for us. Thanks for that. I had a question about the uh, what popped up there. The um, the Robbie Swan takes a micro dot. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the, the photograph we really wanted to show of Robbie Swan was him naked doing tantric meditation, but the publishers kept saying it just was it was a bit fuzzy, so <laughs> we couldn't use it. But well, the, the chapter about Robbie Swan, I just found delightful. And, and we also realised we'd been arrested together at the so-called Day of Rage in Canberra, but hadn't sort of realised it because 169 or something were arrested that day. But um, yes, I, Robbie, of course, is well known as a fighter against censorship and the founder of the Sex Party, which, of course, now has a member of parliament in Victoria. But... Um, when I asked him what had radicalised him, he just said very simply, he said drugs. And so, it, it, and, and we really probably needed to have a chapter about drugs and that, that was it. He eventually gets arrested and charged with um, uh, growing 600 marijuana plants. And so it's, but it's a very 60s story. So, and he has remained a, a radical and a good fighter for lots of good things. Well, uh, I think I mentioned in the lead up to this, uh, just before we began, that um, uh, Rose Jackson was uh, there with her Roosters jersey on for Anzac Day, but she's also been doing a very good job in the New South Wales Parliament about uh, legalisation of cannabis and pointing out that New York, I think, legalised cannabis this week and has joined Virginia and about 25 other states. But of course, it's not even on the agenda here in New South Wales, although ACT have moved on it. So that might bring up a question of, uh, obviously, there's been a lot of cultural um, and political success out of the radical movements of the 60s and 70s. What do you see as, you know, uh, perhaps where we didn't succeed and maybe any clues as to why? Well, we totally didn't succeed in stopping stupid, criminal, dreadful, violent wars because we invaded Iraq and, and a million people in Australia marched against Iraq. And that government still invaded Iraq. So, yes, we eventually got the Australian troops out of Vietnam. And, you know, but we needed to have a Labor government elected before that happened. Um, and we, we, we certainly stopped um, racially selected um, sporting tours to Australia. I mean, after the 1971 um, Springbok demonstrations, there wasn't another racially selected um, team came to Australia ever. So we, we totally won that. We, we, in the end, we stopped executions. We, uh, but there's a whole lot of failures. We, well, I mean, not the obvious failure is the yeah. Aboriginal yeah. movement, yes. yes. I mean, in a week that yet another person's died in custody, um, that's, that's the big failure. But um, the, cur the current upsurge of angry young women is just wonderful to see because the ongoing failures um, for women, um, the fact that many women of our age are homeless um, is part of, the, part of the struggle that hasn't been completed. And then of course the issue that wasn't around in the 60s is the refugee issue and the climate change issue. And these issues well, the climate change issue has just got such a long end time to it. And there's so many forces that you've got to kind of bring into alignment. I would feel pretty daunted if I was a young person today to be struggling to think of 
how to deal with that. We actually had issues that, at least in Vietnam and apartheid, you could go boom, boom, stop this now, stop this now, and hope to get some um, short-term reaction. And we are very close to finishing, but I thought uh, one last question, which relates directly to that is from Gilmore Chimbatete. Um, I should uh, mention in our introduction that it's far too short to mention all of Meredith's uh, activism, but Meredith's a great activism on Zimbabwe and uh, so where Gilmore hails from originally. Um, now I think in Hornsby. Good morning, Gil. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Gilmore said, what do you think needs to happen to this generation to rekindle the radicalism experienced in the 1960s? Oh, I have absolute faith in this generation. I think that it's, it's quite different because they have different ways of getting their message out. As Nadia often points out, our only way of getting our message out, apart from chalking on, on pavements and, and slapping up posters at night, our only way of getting our message out was to go out and get arrested on the streets. Whereas today you have so many different platforms uh, in social media that you can get your message out. And it is being done. And, you know, what the young people today are doing is terrific. It's, it's, it's a different sort of activity. But I went to the, um, the environment, uh, you know, the, what was it, the extinction um, demonstration at the end, I think it was the end of 2019. And it was huge. There were, there were tens and tens of thousands and they were mostly young. And when Nadia and I went to the Black Lives Matter demonstration at the beginning of 2020, um, once again, they were young people and we didn't know any of them. It was wonderful because we're no longer relying on our generation. I've got absolute faith in the, the new generation. And I was very lucky in the end of 2019 when those climate change demos were going on, I happened to catch one in Nuremberg of all places. So in the place of the Nuremberg rallies to be um, with a bunch of school kids rallying there. And then a few days later, um, I was in France and I just got off the train very, very early and the streets were full of all the school kids who weren't going to school that day. And to march around the streets of Florence was fantastic. So to feel that international movement is terrific and yes I, I have faith in this generation who are new and young today and indeed just this week I went to Sydney Uni to get some books out of the library and I found two young people chalking up just as we used to do and chalking up general strike meeting at the law lawn not at the front lawn and um, I stopped and take, took a photo assured them I wasn't ASIO and had a little chat with them so even they find chalk a good alternative to Twitter. <laughs> it certainly is. And I think um, with that, we might, we're almost on the hour. So I have to thank Nadia Wheatley and Meredith Bergman profusely for taking time for this. You've got more launches coming up. I've put the link to the, it's where to buy the book uh, from Booktopia a couple of times in the chat, but everyone knows how to use Google. Um, and thank you all for so much for coming. Now we have played, Country Joe and the Fish, the Vietnam song. Uh, Nadia, Meredith and I had a bit of a discussion about what we would play to take us out. I'm making, there was, we had, uh, I'm not sure if I've got the full consent of the meeting, but I'm going to play Vietnam <laughs> by Jimmy Cliff because I like to finish with reggae. I and love Jimmy Cliff. Me, yeah. I once ran into Meredith at a Jimmy Cliff concert at the State Theatre and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world that our Labor State uh, President of the Upper House was at the Jimmy Cliff concert. I thought that was awesome. So we we'll finish with that and say thank you to you all. As I said uh, in the chat, you can now send a message to Meredith and to Nadia and to anyone else, any other comrades that are in the meeting to say g'day and uh, catch up with them very briefly while we play that. But if you'd like to, you can um, you can hang up now as we play the, uh, the Vietnam song. But I'll give the final word to Meredith and Nadia before we do that. Oh, Nad, do you want to... Oh, well, just thanks to the Search Foundation for organising it and for giving us a way to talk to people. And one of the great things with this book is that it started a conversation. So we've been getting emails, we've been getting messages reminding us of funny things like the Daily Telegraph journalists who used to hold our handbags. We can handbags on demonstrations who would hold our handbags while we went up to the sit-in um so you know i've got a website 
Um, anyone can email it. If you want to send in a funny memory or a sad memory or a stirring memory, do that or do it via the Search Foundation because it's great now to keep this conversation moving along. And I'd just add to that that if you have um, memories of your own or, in fact, you have parents or aunts and uncles with memories of their own, do get them written down because otherwise these stories disappear. Write them down, either send them to Nadia, make certain that someone gets them. The uh, Labor History Society, the Sydney Labor History Society, they're just interested in this stuff, all being written down because, you know, otherwise our generation moves on and uh, it's all gone. And as I say to people, and with your papers too, do get them archived, do send them to the right place because otherwise when you die, your nephew puts them all in a skip and they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. There's a plea. And by the way, I'll give a quick plug to Comrades, which Meredith, of course, launched last uh, October, which is almost sold out. So if you want to get a copy of that, you've got to get in quick. There's less than 100 copies left. So, uh, But, of course, go on and buy uh, from Booktopia, get to your copy of Radicals, and, uh, yeah, get your copy of Comrades as well from New International Bookshop. So thank you both so much, and thanks, everyone, for being on the call. I'll now play... Vietnam by Jimmy Cliff and we'll message, message each other in the chat while we do so.